from uh, Gareth Guy Bookshop, one of the co organizers, together with the Penang Institute. Uh, sadly, Salman can't be with us here tonight uh, to say a few words of welcome. But we have Stephen Sim here, and no doubt he'll uh, say a few words of welcome. Uh, well, this is the 14th. We're getting quite old, Mr. Sal. The 14th of the Santara Forum. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, in other words, we survived number 13. I'm lucky number 13. And a lot seems to have happened since we all uh, gathered, especially uh, we were able to listen to the uh, <coughs> uh, the Mayor Tolpa, I was going to say, but it actually wasn't true. Lord Janarian, 91 year old Mahathir Mohammed, speaking in front of uh, one and a half thousand people, saying with a very straight face uh, that he never took any money, honestly. He didn't take any money whatsoever. Um, anyway, uh, we're not going to talk about uh, the Dekarasi riot tonight. Instead, we have, uh, I think, a very interesting session. Uh, ahead of us. Uh, it was last year when, per chance, I bumped into this young woman, Michelle Yuzoulas, in the bookshop. And she was surrounded by a phalanx of bodyguards from the uh, Penang Institute. <laughs> I will name them and shame them because they're sitting here in the audience. <laughs> And they seem, you know, we're very important people, they seem to create a sort of circle around her, this kind of cordon sanitaire where no one can get, uh, get, get, get close to her. But we managed to speak and we kept in contact and I invited Michelle uh, to come and on this VSAC day enlighten us uh, and reflect basically on any number of things uh, uh, about which she's eminently suitably qualified. Speak. See, I'm sitting to bar by here. And I thought, very boringly and predictably, she talked about her work as a campaigning lawyer. Uh, many of you will know that Michelle worked for a number of years after she came back from her studies as a lawyer with Lawyers for Liberty. And uh, she had the task often of representing pro bono uh, a number of people who have been in particular uh, charged with sedition, but also cases that have involved deaths in custody and much else besides. Uh, a reflection of the baleful uh, state of affairs in the Malaysian legal system and justice system. Uh, but perhaps having had enough of all that, Michelle's recently uh, jumped ship and uh, she is now the campaign's coordinator for Amnesty International with a remit that covers into Alia, uh, four quite dodgy countries in our region. Uh, the Philippines, who's just uh, elected body as president, the man who advocates using vigilante squads to basically shoot street kids, criminals or anybody without any due process at all. Singapore, she also covers, who just hanged a young man yesterday. Again, I think, notwithstanding what your own thoughts are about the death penalty, without any due process of law. Indonesia, where I think it's eminently clear that. Uh, oh, you're not Indonesia. That would be too much to ask. <laughs> yes, Brunei. Well, what is there to say about Brunei? Yes. <laughs> Best uh, covered uh, like that. And last but not least, she's still the campaign manager for Amnesty for Malaysia. So you haven't quite landed us all together, but you've become a, an internationalist. Uh, justice without borders. Mm -hmm. That's going to be your hashtag justice without borders. Now, I thought that uh, Michelle was going to talk about some of those things, and indeed she may do. Who knows? I've got no idea what she's going to talk about. But in fact, she wanted to set up a different kind of conversation with us tonight. And this was with the provocative title, The Quiet Girl She Played. Don't make history. 
but noisy ones do, so I'm presuming she's going to be very, very noisy to her in her effort to make history. This is actually a serious topic because it reflects upon uh, something in Michelle's own experience, so it's a, it's a kind of experiential sharing that she'll be doing with us. On the whole notion of girl power, it's not an uncontested uh, idea uh, since it probably emerged in public discourse in the 1990s. But this notion that young women can, through various means, culturally and politically in particular, assert their uh, autonomy and their uh, identity and begin to inhabit spaces that are culturally and politically important in any given society. Of course, that has also been uh, argued against, contested in all kinds of ways, and perhaps uh, in what we're going to hear tonight would have a sense of those apparent tensions, contradictions, or whatever. And together with Michelle on the platform tonight, uh, we have two very eminent people in that On Michelle's immediate left is uh, Shagina Rashid. She is a uh, counselor for MPPP here in Penang, representing the Democratic Action Party. And uh, she and Michelle have been having a conversation uh, about the scope of tonight's forum. And then, belatedly, I was asked, as a special thing, to invite this rose <laughs> among the four. <laughs> Stephen Sayre, <coughs> Member of Parliament, I'm trying to embarrass me. I'm not trying to embarrass you, I'm just telling you as I see it. But in particular, he wears, a, he wears several hats. Uh, but in particular, he wears a hat as the chair of the Canadian Development Forum. Uh, the director. One of the directors of the Canadian Women's Development Corporation. How we got the job that <laughs> But we'll no doubt find out uh, as the evening proceeds. That's one of his many hats. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a very, very warm and welcome to Michelle. outside the 
image as politicians. They have very, very interesting personal lives. And this is actually a discourse which people try to ignore, you know. You, know, you see, they have to no one knows that he actually has two animals called Kimi and Rhino. No one knows what animals they are, but you know, no one talks about these things which make them more human, more approachable. So that was why I thought this setup would be interesting. So I'm going to start off with um, this whole riot girl quiet thing. Okay. This riot girl, very simply, is a movement in the 90s, and I want to use this as a vehicle to look into our current system in Malaysia, in the political sphere, imagery of women, where women are, and how women try to change the system. Do they break stereotypes? Do they break laws? Do they break ideas? You know, and just all these things about where women are today. And I'm only going to look today, I'm not going to go and take you through a historical, you know, theory of Slada, you know, because I wasn't born. So I'm going to... And people always make me go through off that line and I'm like, actually I wasn't around, so you know, I can tell you post per se, because that was when I was conscious and actually I understand things a lot better than um so anyway I will start off with um, this uh, what it is is that Riot Girl is a combination of punk style and politics creating safe spaces and then we look at imagery. So the first off if you're a woman in Malaysia, again, this is of course very general, you can disagree with me. We always face with these two images, you know. The obedient woman, the most extreme, of course, would be the obedient wives club. I think many of us might still remember where a woman who is most obedient, most loved by her husband, must be obedient and allow polygamy and must be very happy as you commit polygamy. You must be very happy to be, quote unquote, first class prostitute to keep your husband at home and you must be able to cook to you know. That is one side of the fence. And this is an extreme, extreme. And then there is the other side where, you know, women who fight the stereotypes, people who are disobedient, I would consider them modern day riot girls. And um, so the question is how, who are these people? Where, where are they? Who, when you talk about today's riot girl, who would you call a riot girl, you know? I mean, um, but that's why we start localizing the terms. I mean, we do not have many women walking around with the boots and the, you know, the hair. No, I think it was like a 90s thing. And we don't expect people to perform in public life to look like this anymore. And why? Maybe because there is a certain stereotype people still expect you to have when you appear in public. You know, I mean, as cool as somebody might be, you know, it might be, people might think twice if they want to have their hair purple and walk into parliament, you know, be a pub. I know maybe you might try it one day, but you know, for now, it's, I've yet to see that extreme as well. And then, um, so what image is that? I'm going to look at civil society, women in civil society versus women in politics. And what is interesting is that if you look today, and in fact, if you stretch back to GMI, the Dr. Mansokan ISA, you stretch back even during Ops Lanam, there were always women in Malaysia, you know, so women being empowered and women speaking up next to men, alongside men, is actually something that we can very proudly say is part of our history. You know, you look back, and then now if we flash back to today, you look at Bursin, I mean, that is the most recent movement, which you can say is global. It's actually a very woman-oriented struggle, because if you look at the faces that are running the forefront of Bursin, if you go on every highlight at Brazil in Kuala Lumpur, a lot of the highlights were actually men by women. You know, we put Jabba Ambika as the face and now Maria Chin. And then if you look at the people that were all arrested for speaking at the final day, I think there were like five women and only two men. And we have Mahdeep Singh and Sarah Jumanda. But other than that, we have Fadia, we have Mashali Zahamza, and these were actually women. And if you broaden the topic, during this period, civil society has a vast array of women. And it seems to be a very broad spectrum when you have Malay women, Chinese women, Indian women, people from different diverse backgrounds. And then you contrast it with politics. Although, and I say again, both of them will be able to elaborate in a much better way. But if we compare the amount of women in civil society and the broadness and inclusive nature of it, because if we even see now Nisha Ayok, she's a trans woman, and she's included on the platform as well. She's been receiving awards abroad. Women's Institute's call her to speak at events. Like, and to be fair, to Malaysia's credit, it is actually a very 
inclusive system because historically abroad there are many feminist movements where they are not pro trans, they are not pro LGBT, they are in fact very exclusive for cisgender women, which again completely disagree with. So, in a sense, Malaysian civil society, I think we're living in an incredibly interesting time. It's incredibly vibrant, and there's just so many people on the on the forefront, on the front lines, and they're not afraid to back down. If you see the last few years, more and more women have been speaking out, and in reverse, laws have been coming down on them. I turn your attention to three women, I think in the span of last year, who actually have been victims of. This is not state agents, but non-state agents. State, non-state agents, like, you know, Twitter, crazy people on Twitter, like, crazy people on Twitter, netizens, people, cyber troopers, people who hurt sexual abuse at them. Uh, North Florida, for example, the speaker at G25, uh, the spokesperson for the G25 movement. We have Aisha Tajuddin, even if you remember, beginning of last year, she came up with a video about Hudud, criticizing the practice of Hudud in Kelantan. They went after her, and the third person, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, is the case of Maisara, um, Maisara Amira, if I'm mistaken. She is actually is one of a, the only girl that was arrested during last year's May Day rally. She, I think there were about 33 or more people that were arrested for going on the street for May Day rally, saying they were anti-GST and anti-PPA. There were about, I think, 30 boys, 32 boys that were arrested and one girl. She was alone. She told me she was just stuck there because you know she came we all went for the protest, but somehow she was picked up for being around naughty looking boys who were really anarchist stuff, you know. So they presume she was part of the sea, anarchist girl, punk girl, so you know, she must be trouble compared to the other girls who don't look as punkish as her. So again, this is all just, you know, you don't fit into the stereotype, we're going to pick you up. And the thing, the startling thing about these three cases was that all of them have faced a degree of sexual harassment. Noor Farida, G25, she made a statement that, you know, I think uh, they must review the practice of Guru Blog, if I'm not mistaken, right? And she got backlash. A man commented on Facebook, I'm going to go to your house, I'm going to rape you, I'm going to break into your house. Um, the other case, Aisha Tajuddin, after she released the BFM video, people, on the daily, people were sending her rape threats, murder threats, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to burn you, you know? Nothing was done. And my Sarah, she filed a police report last year saying that there was a policeman during interrogation. It was a man. Put her in a room, told the woman police that I will tell her to go out if you don't confess. And she said, confess to what? Confess to the movement you're part of an anarchist, you know, you're part of this movement to throw that gym. She said, no, I'm just a kid here. I was at the rally, you know, I was wrapping up and I was about to go home. And as he kept insisting on her, because this is public knowledge, she's reported, so this is no longer private, she has decided to go public with the information. She reported that as they were trying to make her confess, they told her, look, there's a camera here, all I can do is rape you and sell the tape, I'll make a lot of money. And this was said by a policeman. This is because the man himself was carrying out interrogations. This wasn't a rogue agent, this wasn't a man pretending to be a policeman, this was a policeman. And usually, in the event somebody committed a crime, what will you do? You make a police report, they'll call in suspects, look out, you know, just see where the suspect, and she says she can recognize him. Because this, you know, wasn't like, the guy ran, but it's, it's not like that word. This is not a drug theft thing, snatch theft. This was, she was in the room, like this. Eventually, I think after half an hour, you remember what the person looks like. After she filed the police report, within a month, First of all, the investigating officer was not very cooperative. He just did not answer our calls. They kept calling her in for statement. Allegedly, they called in several other cops without consultation with her. She had no chance of identifying who the perpetrator was. And finally, after I think a month or two, with the excuse of we can't deal with the case, they came back and said, oh yeah, it's NFA, no further action. Why? The usual answer like, oh, who did we have the discretion, so throw your case out. She's filed a report to Sumatra, I guess they're following up now, but the point is that all these three women, and there are more cases of sexual harassment against activists, these are the three I picked up. No action has been taken against them. But these women have been investigated themselves. Aisha Tajuddin was called in for investigation for the video she made. Noor Farida was said to be calling for investigation as well, but I think they ended it halfway after she decided to make a lot of knocks. 
but they had links to exactly who these perpetrators were. Aisha Tajuddin and Nur Farida, the profiles were public. You could see the guy, I think it was like some blog rescue or something. Everyone knew who he was. This wasn't a made up profile, these were real people. Why was there no effort to go after them? I mean, even I was part of the, <laughs> the big problem where when I found out they were not going after Aisha Tajuddin's perpetrators, it was also my fault I didn't think about the IGP. Not the best idea now, but it seemed like a good idea then. So I was like, you know, okay, I also did it 50 times one day, so maybe it was also my fault. I was just like, why aren't you taking, you know, why aren't you doing anything? This country is overrun by, you know, rapists and people who don't respect women. So there were 50 tweets. He didn't pay attention until one day he decided to, and he decided to arrest me as well. And so I had to go and basically explain to them why I tweeted at him. He was not taking action. So, you know, I mean, not that Twitter changes anything, except it upsets people and upsets important people. And clearly, as you see. And I was investigated, and I didn't say anything apart from the fact, look, why are you investigating me? Go after the people who are actually threatening to rape and kill her. They're like, no, but you are upsetting the majority. Like, majority who? The majority must be male for calling them rapists. It's like, uh, why did you do that? So, you know, it just somehow it came to the conclusion when you're talking about majority Malaysian people, it can be racialized that they're going to arrest you, but they're not going to arrest the actual perpetrators. So, that's the state of things. And I can go on and on about how Maria Chin, Amiga, the flag they get every other day, the people who took out their hands and did the, well, they did the bad exercises outside Amiga's house. When you're a woman, you take on the persona in public. Sometimes people think that it's a green light take a pass at you, to objectify you, to sexualize you, or to tell you how ugly you are. Yeah, you get that every day. As soon as you're public, you know, whatever you are, yeah, you're very ugly, you're a prostitute, stop starting yourself out to the media, you know. And so somehow, by delegitimizing your existence, I guess, of course not all men, but you know, people who are against game changers. This is how they put, in, put you in your place. So then I want to go to, very briefly, look at women in politics, because as I was discussing with Sharina, this is just very vague, this is just a personal observation. If you look at women who are currently, in the traditional sense, legislators, you still have very overpoweringly the women that represent the good women. One as is a, no, is a, I'll say her, but she is shy, so I'm move away, you know? History battle, these are all women that in their society are considered good women, highly educated, well spoken, fairly conservatively dressed. You, know, you don't see them walking on mini skirts, you don't see them like smoke breaking it down, you know, you don't see those things. Or do we? I don't know. They, they might disagree with me, but they are just less photographs of them being the naughty girl, you know, unless the photo surfaced and you know about it. But my point is that there is still this demand from legislators, from, from electorates themselves, from the community, that they want good women to lead. And as soon as, as soon as you hear a whiff of a rumor, if like for example, you know, there are women where there are rumors of scandals or a photo of not even them, but they're wearing a bikini, kind of looks like them. Everybody's like, oh, she's wearing a bikini, it's really bad. You know, and then these tiny rumors, which technically have no bearing on the policy making abilities. I mean, if you, do, if you do a realistic check, how do you dress? How do you behave in terms of what you do in your free time? How do you speak? Does this really impact your ability to be a capable lawmaker? But people don't really ask that question. Also. So, you know, I'm also quite concerned, but then I'll flip it back. Is this something that is bad just to women, or is this general? Because, again, you know, maybe Stephen could answer this, where if you look at the men, are they also actual people who interrogate the stereotypes? Or are they also generally good men, you know? I, you know I've not seen any photo of him in Zouk, you know, I don't know. Not that there's anything wrong with being in Zouk, but I have not seen a hard night biting Steven. <laughs> Unless you have photos. That's quite cool. Um, so, <laughs> oh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. See, if that's what politicians do, they have that, you know. Anyway, I'm moving on. Um, so, going back to it, why I actually asked Sharina to come on board was that I read an article about beauty pageants and I thought she hit the nail on the head with Malaysian situations. You see, in other countries, uh, I once listened in on an English 
parliament where they were actually talking about the problem with objectification in daily life. Objectification of women in workplaces, that's where sexual harassment comes on board. Objectification of lawyers, female lawyers, because to be very honest as a girl, I actually get more harassed in court than outside court. Because people just don't believe you. Can you get married? You know, you're on the way to police station, you're on the way to court, then you know it's divided, the criminal court is here, civil court is here, because all the, the nice girls are in civil court, right? They're just stuck there. And then just like, oh, but you know, girl, your husband may not want to marry you, you know, after you do criminal, you know, you're, you're like with all these people. Like, with what people? No goodness. I was like, okay, first of all, I don't like me, isn't thinking of criminal as well. But you know, the point is that there are far less women who do criminal law. For starters, and everybody's just so worried that the woman might be tainted by her job. So, you know, and then the other thing is that, you know, people think it's okay to tell you you look great or you're ugly in the course of your work. You know, I mean, how much flag do certain women have? Or, you know, how much, women, how much problems do they have when they're objectified? I mean, you have people going on board and like, vote for this person because this person is very beautiful, you know, and then they've gone on. This is the new brand of politics in Malaysia, you know, this is the selfie politics. And we're accepting it. And when you do say, this is not right, people tell us, yeah, of course you don't think it's right because you're ugly, you know. And so, and people use this to silence you. And we accept it because when you say, you know, oh, you're very pretty, you're supposed to say thank you, be grateful, why aren't you grateful, why are you telling me, don't tell me what I look like. So this is a conversation of, 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 of saying no to objectification and somehow it's just the system eats you back because people expect you to like being objectified. Again, this is seen sexual harassment suits. Whenever your boss tells you, hey, you're very sexy, you look good in your, your legs, look good in that dress. 20 years ago, I think many people, 20 years ago, I know, many people thought it was acceptable to treat women like that. But then now, after people have started realizing this is not the best practice, people come to work not to be very interested in what they look like. If they want to be the kind of that like that, they can open pageants, should tell us not like. But you know, if you go to work, you're supposed to be validated the same exact way with your colleagues. So that's why when people tell you certain things, you look like a certain way. I always ask them, would you say that to go being seen dear at God? Hey, go big, you're really sexy today. If you don't do that, why? Because you can't. Why can't you? It's because you're respecting. So why can't you respect the other women? Why can't you treat the women like that? Is that because they're just here for decoration? So from that, I just want to come back and fight with myself. I don't have time. I don't have time. <coughs> um, okay, come on, so, okay. So the point of this talk, I set up with riot girls make history and quiet girls do not. I set it up to fail because I myself never agreed with the dichotomy. I think the most powerful sometimes is actually quiet people. And these are the people we don't raise up as often as we should. I have all due respect to the women that have been paving their way through people like Amita, people like Nikoya, people like Marichi, who tirelessly fight. You know, and if you realize all these women are from different backgrounds, different different race, different religion, different beliefs, and they you know, and many other women. One and these are, even though I still do feel this, this, you know, they fit into the stereotype of being a really good person, well educated, well spoken, you don't see them shouting bad press language at people, you know, they, they're all still good women to a certain degree. But then I want to look at the quiet women as well, and that's why I'm very glad that you brought up Singapore because the people we don't talk about, the most powerful method of going through a certain experience as a woman is actually to be yourself. Where you do not stand outside with a placard. Where women are put into situations without choice. I'm looking at the case of Ko Jabing, for example, because uh, I was part of the death penalty team in Southeast Asia and we were all working until the night, every other day, ever since his appeal was dismissed. Um, they found out by surprise but that's how it happens even in Malaysia. You only find out that your loved one is going to be executed the no, same week. You get the letter, it's like, Dear ma'am, your brother, your son, whoever, will be executed on Friday at dawn. Usually it's like that. Malaysia is like that, Singapore is like that. Usually by super prayers, they will execute the person. And just so happens, Ko Jabing's sister, I believe she's my age, she's 28 this year, she found out that Ko Jabing will be executed on her birthday, which was yesterday. And this was found by letter and 
I did not see the letter myself, but the gist would be you have to go and make your arrangements, how you're going to collect the body, your know, final arrangements. And so she found out and she let the organisations know. And this is when you start in motion because death penalty is very different. Because I used to do death in custody. Death in custody is when you go after the system. It's accountability. But when you're in death, the death penalty is literally if they decide to run your clemency, they can. They can, but sometimes they don't. And then so the thing, this, how do people know that for jumping is how do people know his story? It's through his mother and his sister. And through telling, it's just merely I have a brother. My brother's trial in itself, I don't know how well it was conducted because from what I understand is that he was actually not, he was mentally incapacitated because he was drunk and also he was not in a state of mind but these things were not put to trial. And also the fact that when he was sentenced to death, it was a unanimous decision, it was 3 to 2. And from what I understand, because Singapore's changed its laws, there should be certainty when you want to convict somebody and sentence them to death. So these, there were certain uncertainties raised in the case. And how did we know of this? Because we're in Malaysia. These were all brought forward by his mother and sister. And if we all recall the case of Toby Hawk with his sister, it is a very similar way they just carry themselves. They did not ask for attention. They are not asking for media because you lost your loved one. But just as being themselves, their own quiet, brave self, just telling stories from their own perspective. That was how they drove, they single-handedly drove the campaign from Singapore to Malaysia and all over Asia. I mean, now people know who Ko Jabeng is. And not because, yeah, he, con he was convicted, he's convicted of murder, yes. We are not asking him to be released. We are merely asking for a more humane type of penalty. To be imprisoned for life or to be you know, imprisoned with the look of reformation. The problem with death penalty is does it actually affect crime? Is it an actual deterrent? A lot of people say yes, we should kill Koja Bing. But if people did not know, the reason why Koja Bing was not executed for a long period of time, he was convicted in 2010. The laws were then amended to have Singaporean judges have the discretion to sentence somebody to death. So during that period, they actually imposed a moratorium. There was from 2011 to 2013, nobody was hanged in Singapore. Take zero hangings because they were taking into account reviews. Nobody knew that. You know, and only after the case of Koja Bing, where you know, this was brought up by the families and then you, know, you do some research and yes, Singapore did impose a moratorium to look into changing their laws. But the fact is that during those three years, if there were no hangings and then they brought back hangings, why hasn't anybody talked about the, the decreased rate of crimes? You know, because they say it's deterrent, right? But the fact is that these things are carried out in secret. No one actually knows who's being hung and when and for what. Does it really help people not want to commit crimes. So these, they expose the greatest truths in the system just by being their quiet selves. And I think I'm just going to bring another case which has been settled in the high, has been decided in the High Court. It's the case of Amin Rashid. For me, because I was in the case from the first day, where there's a 15-year-old boy, 14-year-old boy who took his sister's car for a joyride. He was speeding the police under the, what they said they wanted to stop his car. They shot at the time, but they failed to be shot him. Now what happened is that he died. But then when the police was charged for shooting him, uh, he was not on the side. He was acquitted. Why? Because he was doing his job. He was shooting to stop the car. He just happened to incidentally shoot the boy. So he's not guilty because he had no intention to kill him. He was shooting at the tire. Even though he shot 21 shots at the boy with his gun and auto. But somehow the, the, the court of appeal, which is the highest court for this case, acquitted him. He was free. This man who shot Amin Rashid fatally in Goblet, there was only one guy shooting when Amin Rashid died. There were two police shooting, but when he was in the housing area, he's in a housing area, he wasn't even in a highway. He shot him. But they still acquitted him. And so with this, from what I understand, the systemic flaw, with the systemic flaw, the mother and the sister came forward to file the case. And only through their grief, because they were not I can tell you, I don't think these people are looking for me yet. And because you lost your son. It is the most difficult thing to talk to somebody when your son is 14. This is his young, her youngest son. He didn't even see for his PMR yet because he, he, he didn't make it. And, but through her experiences, her sharing, her ability to speak 
about the grief and how how much of a torment it was to write. She wrote to the Prime Minister. She wrote to the IGP, who was then the head of Selangor Police. The IGP refused to issue an apology. So through this, you understand how the system works when you deal with families of loved ones. And these are people who do not put themselves in the situation. So it was just, I was just taking this time again for us not to forget that quiet activism is something we don't really see. We, I just thought of bringing it up because I remember the late Irene Fernandez, before she passed on, she had an idea to get all the mothers to share their experiences. Because the mother of Kugan, also another victim of Polish brutality, she was somebody that had to do with the community. There was the element of shame. There was the element because her son was allegedly known to be a car theft. And so not only did she have to deal with the fact that her son was brutally killed by the police, but the fact that people say, your son deserves to die. He's a criminal, you know. But through her presence, through her fight, when she was just willing to file the case through lawyers and just stand clear until her son's name was clear. Because I, I recall most of us only understood truly what police brutality is through Kugan's kids. Yes, he was suspected of a crime. Yes, he was arrested. Yes, he was put in lockup for investigation. But he was not, he did not go for trial. Nobody ever found him guilty. So the fact that he was murdered without due process in police lockup, the police were playing executioner. And is that right? I remember I was in law school at the time during Kugan's case. And I had a professor whom I deeply respected till today. But he said Kugan deserved to die. Because you know what, you're Indian gangster, you know what Indian gangsters right? like we should have. You know? So yeah, yeah apparently you know. Like good thing, you know, this what Vigilanteism, people seem to really like the idea. Move on to that. But yeah, so maybe it's because of TV shows where you know policemen open fire without you know, without thinking as much as they should. But the point was that at that time the attitude was that look, this guy was a suspected criminal, he deserved to die. But only because Kugan's mom stepped up and she was willing to endure the shame, the hate. Because this is not only from the state. When you take the public step, as I said before with the activists, you have to deal with your own communities. I've had mothers that have had sons paralyzed, neck down, neck brace, drill is dead, held up by iron. They don't want to sue the police. Why? Because everyone will know that the son went to lock up. And the worst part was that when the son went to lock up for a heavier penalty, the court later on reversed it and found that the drugs he was carrying, he shouldn't have even been in lockup. They could have made him out of bail the same day. You know, it was actually a much lighter case than they expected. So he shouldn't have even been in lockup for 10 days. He would have just been let out after 3 days, 4 days. But he was in lockup. And they put, they put him with the other people that were suspected drug traffickers because of the weight. It was just a weight issue. And because he was there, long time, wrong place, they beat him. And he was paralyzed. But when we saw the mother, the mother said, I'm not going to sue the government because everyone knows my son was in jail. Everyone knows my son's a drug addict. I'm so ashamed of him. And my daughter, his sister, her family will disown her because they know her brother's a criminal. And so the far-reaching aspects of these things, we fail to take into account. And I am not going to condemn the mother of the later case because these are also things we don't see. We don't realize how harmful our own our own cultures, are, our own communities are. And also, which is why I come back to the right of quiet world dichotomy. These dichotomies are actually created to keep us in check, you know? Like, my parents are, oh, bad girl, you wear short skirt, you know, you bad girl, get raped, you know, you better cover up. Because you know, only bad girls get raped. And this is how we continue to shame people with these dichotomies that are actually kept in place to keep us in check. And so it's just, but the last cases I was referring to, because of this oppressive mindset that, you know, your son is a bad guy, therefore you are a bad mother, therefore don't fight the government, because they don't know you're a bad mother. And this was the same problem Kugan's mother and Aminu Rashid's mother faced as well. People were telling Aminu Rashid's mother, why did you let your son drive out here and he deserved to die? These ideas are actually more powerful than the laws itself that keep people in check. Yeah, the laws also, the administration, one thing, the laws in place are another thing, but even if we change the laws, we really stick. A lot of it is ourselves and our culture, and these dichotomies we put for ourselves. So, like, you know, we talk about like, the both 
world <laughs> with this conversation. I will just go back to the right girl and quiet girl image. The, set, the reason why I approach Shalina to have this talk is largely because, number one, we don't talk about these things when it comes to women. And it's fully understandable because the focus now is about getting more women in parliament, getting more women in decision making processes in the market, getting more women to do. You know, this is getting women in public life, just visibility, pushing ideas, you know, which I think which I deeply respect because I believe really we have made a lot of progress you know, as women and it is done in such a graceful way where I do not see feminism in Malaysia as any way alienating to men. You know, I, I do not see that. And you see our women activists, Ivy Josea, Irene Fernandez, they share the platform with men and men treat them as equals and vice versa. And this is something I, I am deeply proud of as being part of them. But the issue is that why are we not looking into systemic systemic things that oppress us, things that are less tangible? Because these things are actually sometimes far more powerful than now. We can change everything. They've been changing laws of domestic violence like 2010. Our domestic violence laws have been going through changes. Our rape laws, people are always talking about changing the laws as well. Haven't made that much headway, but the point is that why is there to decrease in this gender related violence? A lot of it has to do with our women. I think everyone knows that. But we're not having the conversation about how we can change this. We are still telling our girls to go wash the dishes, telling our boys not to. You know, all this comes down to stereotypes. How many of us with the privilege? I mean, even I, I admit, mean, I had the privilege of being in public life, being in, being in the limelight, and I did not break stereotypes either. I always wear my own robe when I don't have to. I'll never wear a short skirt after I started appearing publicly. You don't want people to see you as something else because it delegitimizes your existence, you know. And, and perhaps it is time we need to think about what we are doing with these stereotypes when you are able to speak publicly. Because from what I see, women are breaking the glass, the glass ceiling. Women are making tangible changes. But in terms of stereotypes, culture, attitudes, I don't know whether we're doing as much as we can. So I'll give you to the first Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michelle, for that. Um, Shalini, are you going to come respond first? Good evening, everyone. My name is Shalina, and as Michelle, or rather, um, Gareth mentioned, um, one of the 24 councillors of the MPPP. And um, in, in the councillor, I'm uh, sorry, in, in the council, we have 24 councillors. And today, we actually have five women councillors. I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually is a progress. So, something positive, because compared to last year, we only had three. So, you know, things will take time to change, but, you know, it's, it's a matter of perseverance and just, you know, knowing that, you know, you have, you have a lot of restrictions or challenges that, and hurdles that needs to be overcome. Um, so, yeah, and um, as, you know, as, as my role of discuss it today. I'll try my best to, to elaborate a little bit further on what um, Michelle mentioned. Michelle has lots of experience and um, I actually got to know her through Facebook. <laughs> and actually today, and, and we've been, you know, communicating, messaging each other, and we actually have, you know, mutual friends. I've met most of her friends and she has met most of my friends and it was just uh, today that we finally met in person. Oh yeah, and one interesting fact, my brother and her sister play in the same band. Awesome. <laughs> so yeah, it's like one of those things, you know, like, you know, everything just falls into place and it's, it's wonderful. When I first saw her today coming in, it really felt like seeing an old friend. I'm like, oh, this is, this is cool. So, so yeah, I mean, we, we messaged each other and actually uh, we, we talked about, about the topic for today, right? It's a very 90s term. Um, you know, right girls came about as part of the grunge movement in the 1990s. 
Grunge, many of us understand that it's a very male-dominated scene. You know, you have bands like Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Mudhoney. And, you know, I remember being, you know, young, about 12 or 11, I thought, wow, what is this music? It's so cool. Then, you know, I started to realize that there's also another side to it. Riot Girls, and it was a female-dominated scene, and you had bands like Bikini Kill, which, you know, where, where that term Riot Girl came from. Um, I grew up listening to Hole, Bikini Kill, um, Luna Chicks, uh, gosh, L7. And I remember being, you know, such a small, wee, you know, girl growing up, but I thought, you know, these women projected so much strength and empowerment, you know, you know, they had, they had musical skills that were so creative, you know, they stood up there on stage, you know, played drums and guitars, and I thought, wow, that's, that's really cool. I would love to you know, be able to do that someday when I grow up. Um, my brother had a band, and I thought, yeah, you know, that's, I want to be like that at some point. But here's the thing, you know, like, it's not just about, you know, the creative arts. For me, it was actually a whole different thing, you know. It, it, it also represented, you know, women who were very brave at expressing themselves and, you know, very opinionated women. And, um, you know, the contents of some of the songs were also very political. And you also had, you know, a, a bunch of women who were who, who, who may sometimes come across angry, but they had substance. So that's one of the reasons why you know, we, we talked about the topic for tonight. And yes, you know, I, I also at some point had the purple hair, wore the ripped jeans, and uh, the combat boots that I still have that I bought in 1999 at a bundle store in Chunky. still have that. And I used to be in a bit. But you see, Back to the whole, the whole you know, idea of how politicians should present themselves. I mean, unfortunately, you know, it's, you, know you can't do that. And what she mentioned, you, know, you can't go to parliament with you know, purple hair. I can't wear your jeans and attend a council meeting. That's just people not going to take you seriously. And just babbling in. But here's the thing. I mean, when, when we talk about these roles, you know, it's, it's the idea of women, not just women, even men who should stand up and, you know, just say what you mean. I mean, again, coming back to, you know, the Malaysian women. Again, you know, we have different layers of feminism. And also, with that, you also have different layers of how people should act. More so if you're a woman, more so if you happen to be um, a different ethnicity. And it changes, the game changes when you have you know, religion, when religion comes into play. So, I write, and um, I've been told that, you know, my, my articles can sometimes come across as very, well, not cool, but, you know, I, 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 could, I could get into trouble at some point, I guess. And this is something that my parents often tell me, that, you know, you might want to tone it down a bit. But, for me, I really don't think that we have the privilege or the luxury to tone it down. I mean, you look at how this country is going. I mean, okay, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We're regressing. And a lot of people think that women empowerment, women's rights, it's a new idea, but it's not. What is new is how women are being treated nowadays. Women are being told, you know, you have to act a certain way, you know, you have to see the right things, you have to dress a certain way. I remember back when my grandmother was still alive. She passed away in 2006 when she was 102 years old. Very healthy, but you know, she came from a very different era. She lived through um, World War II, communist, um, yeah. so she, she was very strong. She, she started, I remember she, my, my parents mentioned this, she started working at the, uh, as a rubber tapper in one of the plantations in Kedah uh, when she was 10. She got married when she was 14 to her first husband. He passed away, so she actually married three times. They all passed away. But um, 
She was a very strong woman. And if you think about it, there were actually lots, many, many women who had that strength. But sadly, no one really talks about that. I know that uh, recently, Penang Monthly published uh, an article of you know, the, the strong Malay women. And you know, it's just people need to remember that there are lots of really strong women out there. Back in the day, and history books will tell you that. But it's just a matter of information. People don't, you know, people tend to forget history or you know, people who write history and whatnot. But the point I'm trying to make is that when certain things come into the equation, such as, for example, religion, you know, that's when the, the game changes and it becomes very volatile and dangerous. So this is where Malaysia is right now. I mean, I'm standing here talking to you as, and speaking to you as a Muslim Malay woman. You know, a lot of people say, you know, you're a Muslim woman, why aren't you wearing a headdress? Why are you even in politics? Are you, are you not afraid? Um, I, every once in a while, in my honest moments, yes, I do worry about stuff. But like I mentioned earlier, you know, we're in the stage where we can't, we cannot let fear dominate what we need to do to make sure that this country is, you know, being directed in the right track. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's really great that we have women like, you know, Michelle. And you know, she's, she's fancy. I mean, just Google her and you know, you know the stuff that she, she does. It's, it's amazing. I remember um, one of the first times I, I got to know her, there's actually this black, really cool black and white photo. It's her, Surendran, uh, Latifa, and you know, they're walking. It's very reminiscent to the Beatles every road. It's all black and white. And I thought, wow, oh, that itself is a powerful image. And for me, I mean, I, I studied in art, in the USM, that itself kind of is reminiscent to you know what you would say the quiet woman. You know, sometimes to get your message across, you do not have to show or be emotional. It's how you know you deliver. You know, it's all about the substance, the content. I think that speaks more volume. So there's a lot of challenges, as mentioned earlier, you know, for women and sometimes men. Uh, I know that recently, last night, there was a very interesting uh, forum that happened in Kuala Lumpur. I think it was a, it was a book discussion, Juanita Sosa, and it was actually a, a book discussion with, uh, the book was written by female uh, women from ISMA. ISMA is uh, this organization that's very, how would you call it? <laughs> very conservative. I mean, let's, let's put this into perspective. They have, a, they have a women's wing, and I often come across their articles, and they, they're the ones who say that yeah, women have you know, domesticated genes. They're the ones who say that women have to you know, play the complementary role for men. And, I don't necessarily believe that that's true, but these women do, and that's you know just an example of internalized sexism, which I feel is a result of being brought up in a society filled with insecure men and women. Sorry. <laughs> so, so you know, it's just that when when you have people like that, it's always good to hear their side of the story. Because I mean, let's let's face it. You know, if we sat in a group and everybody agreed on what was being said, it kind of gets boring. So it's always good to hear, you know, the other side. And then, you know, I think that's the discourse that we we believe in, and that is part and parcel of democracy. So actually, you can watch the video. It's it's very interesting, and um, it's just that sometimes. You know, when we talk about change and we talk about, you know, reforms, you know, there are many different levels of what we can you know, work towards. So, okay, I'm just going to digress a little bit. I just remember one thing that Michelle mentioned about the um, Aisha Khadjudin case. Yeah. 
she actually mentioned that there was this dog rescuer that, that, um, that, that, that was mentioned. That was your very idea. Yeah. So just, just to share with you guys a little bit about this dog rescuer, I can't remember his name, but I want, um, what was it, in January 2016, yeah, this year, there was a case where he uploaded some really horrible things on Facebook. Um, although he did not mention the word rape specifically, what he did was insinuate that you know he would crawl into the window of North Florida's house and you know what was it? Have his way with her. Somehow, like insinuating that he would stay in the bed. Like, well, you you, you get the gist. So. You know, obviously that itself is wrong. So a few of us um, with, within the DAP Juanita, we launched a report. We also, you know, we wanted the police to act on this, but it never happened because, again, he said that he did not use the word and there was no way that he could prove it. But again, you know, we, we argued with the policemen that, look, we have evidence of his Facebook post. Are you not going to take any action? He said no, just because he did not specifically say the word rape. So you see, things like this, it's, it happens actually quite, quite often. And this is something that I feel is wrong. And I know everyone here as well thinks, knows that it's wrong. But again, it boils down to how do you overcome this? And again, it comes to you know, the, the idea that you have to understand that this is the time when we need to come together and make sure that everything stops. Um, so I am going to also talk a little bit about the um, last, last two years ago, there was a campaign that uh, one of the State Assembly women for Damansara, the Honorable Yogi Vin, she launched the anti-violence, uh, stop violence against women campaign. And uh, you know, it's something that's important, it's good. We think it's, it's, a, it's, it's an important you know, message to get across. But what happened was when she did that, she too received lots of negative comments to the point where some of the comments said that it's okay to hit women. Because, you know, I'm sure you've heard all of this before. It's, it's horrible. I mean, how can you go on saying things like that? And again, you know, you have evidence on Facebook, on Twitter. But again, when you go to the police, when you want someone to take action, they say, oh, you know, there's nothing they can do about it because of whatever reason. But if the tables were turned, the genders were switched, action would be taken. And this is something that I feel, you know, there shouldn't be any double standards to that. So sometimes in life, you know, you you have to what's the word? You have to um, understand that. I'm sorry. I'm just really I'm just just trying to remember all of the uh, the, the words that came up in the the comments. You know. Sometimes it's also very difficult to not, not take things, you know, personally, because again, you know, as a woman, sometimes I can't help but feel that, you know, what if that happened to me? What if that happened to my mom or someone I know? That would be such a horrible thing. Then, you know, sometimes you're just stuck here and you're trying to figure out how can you make sure that people understand that this is wrong. So. I think you know it's very, very important for you know women, also men, to voice out against such things, to voice out the inequalities. You know that's the only way that you know we can push for reforms. And um, yeah, I think I think that's it. Um, I will stop now. I'll have Stephen carry on. And um, thank you, Julia. Thanks for sharing. First of all, uh, thank you to Gareth and also my 
actually we thank you for organizing this uh, brilliant event. One of our friends here commented that today is Pisat Day. If you guys should be having a holiday, I will bring the smoking stuff. So let's give them a round of applause. just now that one of the reasons I actually offered myself into the panel together was because I inspired by Fadia, Fadia Nakua, a brilliant, excellent lawyer activist. Uh, I promised myself not to speak in any all-male panel. So, in order to balance this up, so when Gareth told me, well, it is two female uh, colleagues of mine going to speak on this issue, I said, why not put a male there? Yeah? So, but yeah, uh, but the you know the dreaded thing about politicians speaking to in a, in a, in a, uh, on women's issue. Uh, Tony Black, love him or hate him, I love him. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. In, in the year two thousand, he was speaking. You know, fresh from <laughs> fresh from his paternity leave, he spoke. Before the women's institute, about a thousand or maybe even up to ten thousand women. And uh, throughout his speech, towards the end of his speech, he was heckled, he was jeered, he was booed, some even walked out. Uh, so I'm trying to avoid his mistake because what he did was actually to talk about, or rather to boast about, uh, what would be Lee Kuan Yin's equivalent of, you know, Penang government gave 200 ringgit to single mother, and you know, we had this childcare center here and there. So I'm going to avoid that. And today I came to prepare. I'm going to cite extensively from my book. <laughs> this one I got it from Karen. Oh, I wish you sell books like this. It's cheap and easy to read. Dude, like this. Five ringgit. Five ringgit. Yeah, this is like 90 bucks. Oh, 75 bucks. I'm going to start by quoting this, this book that I, I bought just recently in KL. Just came back from KL for Parliament. Uh, it's called The Suffragettes. Basically, a collection, a compilation of uh, different articles and leaflets from the era of suffragettes about 100 years back, early 20th century. Page 23. This is an interesting article, uh, or rather, a speech delivered by one Emily Pankhurst. Uh, Emily Pankhurst, the famous suffragette. Uh, from UK, but she delivered this speech in uh, USA when she went to USA. So this is something that she said. I, I'm going to just read part, parts of this thing. Riot girls make history with girls. Riot girls, but something like that. Yeah? So this is what she said. You have two babies very hungry and wanting to be fat. One baby is a patient baby and waits indefinitely until its mother is ready to feed it. While the other baby is an impatient baby and cries lustily, screams and kicks and makes everybody unpleasant until it is fat. Well, we all know perfectly well which baby is going to be attended to first. That is the whole history of politics. You have to make more noise than anybody else. You have to make yourself obtrusive, more obtrusive than anybody else. You have to view all the papers, the papers, media, more than anybody else. In fact, you have to be there all the time and see that they do not know you under. And a very interesting uh, uh, description of some of the things that Pankhurst and her colleagues did in the UK. <coughs> she said, well, in our civil war, people suffered. And she wasn't referring to the uh, Charles the first, I think, civil war. She was referring to the civil war when women in the UK were asking for their rights to vote. In our civil war, people suffered. But you cannot make omelettes without breaking eggs. Interesting illustrations from a woman. Yeah? You cannot have a civil war without damage to something. Yeah? And among other things, the suffragettes in uh, the militant one, so-called, in the UK, did this. Disrupted the system built, constructed by men for men. We entirely prevented stockbrokers in London from telegraphing to stockbrokers in Glasgow and vice versa. For one whole day, telegraphic communication was entirely stopped. I'm not going to tell you how it was done. I'm, going to tell, I'm not going to tell you how the women got to the mains and cut the wires, but it was done. <laughs> it was done and this 
it was proved to the authorities that weak women, quiet women, even suffrage women, as we are supposed to be, had enough ingenuity to create a situation of that kind. Now, if I ask you, if women can do that, is there any limit to what we can do except the limit we put upon ourselves? Emmeline Pennhurst. A hundred years after Pennhurst and her colleague damaged or destroyed the stock brokerage, uh, disrupted the stock brokerage in London and Glasgow, last year, I visited a friend of mine in Tokyo. Uh, her name is Miss Salma Suzaki. Ten years ago, she was 33. I was 33 last year. She listed her company, being the first woman in Tokyo to list her company on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. This is Japan. Highly patriarchal society. Difficult, very, very challenging. But the problem started. And of course, you have to play by men's rules. It's a men's world. Yeah, especially, especially so in Japan, especially so in Tokyo, especially so in the Tokyo Stock Exchange, the corporate, the male chauvinistic corporate world. But the problem started when she had to get married. She wanted to get married. In Japan, if a woman gets married, and this is what she told me, she has to adopt her husband's family name, surname. When she announced that she's going to get married, she practically launched the whole Tokyo Stock Exchange into chaos. Because never before, a chairperson of a public listed company had to change her name. So, a woman disrupting in a very different way, 100 years after the South Korea's. The corporate, the male corporate structure. Why do I say all this? I not. I think I agree fully with Michelle that really most of the time it is not about just laws, but it is about mentality, how society perceives uh, certain things, how society perceives identity of a man and a woman, what a man can do and what a woman can do. When I one day told my wife about you know my advocacy. Uh, my political sifu is Sadari chong -in, who was the uh, former member of parliament for Bukit Bintanyam, and now the current member of Bukit Bintanyam. Uh, she's the women chief, of the, the national women chief. So, from, the, from day one of my political involvement, I've been exposed to uh, advocacy of women's issues. But one day my wife said, you know, quiet girls, and this is where the contrary is to come in, which I am pleasantly surprised that this uh, Michelle actually acknowledged it at the end of the uh, speech. Quiet girls don't <coughs> really just mean non-verbal skills, those who don't talk. Yeah? And even if a, a, a woman decided not to say anything or decided to be a quiet person, it doesn't mean she is submissive, even willingly. This is my wife. And she reminded me that people like her Housewives, and I do not. Uh, and, and in our family, housewife is not a. Uh, it's not a derogatory term. You know, uh, she's a, she's paid a salary to be a housewife. <laughs> <laughs> she's paid a salary to be a housewife. Just it, it's, it's fair. Enough. Um, she reminded me one day. She said, "Hey, you know, we housewife contribute to the GDP, but nobody acknowledge this, and no housewife." ever received a datoship from your Penang government because she's a housewife. I mean, CEOs get uh, you know, datoship, whatever, from your bloody government, but why not housewife? So it, I decided to you know, think further about this issue and I said, yeah, that's true. Housewife actually contributes to the, to, to the GDP. And in 2014, during my parliamentary debate uh, on Najib's budget, 2015 budget, I actually calculated how much housewives in Malaysia contributed in terms of the economy. I mean, 
it's true we need to respect mothers, housewives, whatever women, you know, in the filial sense, in the re gender respect sense. But really, perhaps it's also time for us to think about this uh, sector from from this financial, economic, political sense. And you know, I calculated some figures from the uh, federal government. Homemakers, women who uh, perform care work at home, housewife, takes care of the family, the children, senior citizens at home, contributes 36 billion ringgit a year in the form of what I call mommy tax or homemaker tax. Uh, lost income opportunity. Uh, if the family say, you know, my wife always say, if you if you don't pay this, you are not paying me what what you got a household allowance. It's not a household allowance. You know, you're not paying me. Chinese say jia yu ka yu. How do you say that? Right? Do, 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 what did I do? It's not a big da po. It's not a. It's not an allowance for the house. It's just my salary. See, because he said, if you don't pay me, if we get a domestic helper, you need to pay the domestic helper. If I go out to work, she referred to herself. Go out to work, she will receive a salary. It doesn't make sense if she doesn't receive a salary if she works at home, and it's real work. It's not imaginary work, it's tough work. She's now working at home, taking care of our uh, sick, feverish boy. Uh, so, in form of lost income opportunity, 36 billion ringgit a year. That was in 2014. And uh, just to put things in context, 2012 personal income tax is 23 billion ringgit a year. And GST, of course, is about 50, about 50 billion. So, 36 billion ringgit in form of contribution, in form of this invisible homemaker tax that quiet women are paying, contributing to our society without really any recognition. And uh, recently, in her, that was 2014, my speech, this year, her Labor Day's message, Sadari Chongming, who is the women's ex co of Penang, she decided to pick on this, and uh, now she's pushing the Penang State Government to really tabulate, to calculate what is the financial contribution of women who are staying at home, uh, doing care work to the Penang economy. And I hope uh, this is about the only political stuff I'm going to go to. The people of Penang will support this initiative. Because it's not easy. It's not easy. When you talk about things like this, people say, you know, who are you? It is a housewife. Yeah. It's easy. I mean, it's not easy being a female activist lawyer and a female punk <coughs> rock band counselor. It's not easy, really. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, but imagine homemakers. You know, 1951. It was our first formal statutory election in our country, and that was Georgetown Municipal Council. There were two female candidates. That one of them, Nancy Yap, family of Yap Choi. The other person, her name is J1 Binti Abidin, and she put her occupation. Today, you know, it's not just dreaded to wear uh, to wear a purple dye into parliament. I don't think any female politician or any male politician would put their career as housewife when you go with that day, right? Because society just don't take her seriously. And again, this is not about laws or rules. It's really that you build. Uh, glass ceiling, whatever sticky floor that we have set up for ourselves. But the first ever election in our country, 1951, this one person from Amno no less actually put her, her occupation as a housewife when she contested in the municipal election in 1951 in Penang, here in Penang. Um, <coughs> it's going to be a lot of stories here. Yeah? Women who, but, but I'm going to end with what, what should we do? It's a typical politician thing. Yeah? <laughs> in, 1950, in 1941, this brilliant person, Ahmad Bostaman, do you have his book in your store? Yeah, I would encourage uh, all of us to get this memo, Ahmad Bostaman. Uh, freedom fighter, independent fighter um, from Kesatuan PKM, PKM, Kesatuan. Pasti kebangsaan Melayu Melayu, yeah. It's a left left wing party. Anwar Sabah. 1941, he wrote a book uh, and uh, got a 
arrested under British emergency law. Uh, nothing changes apparently since 1941. In our country. It's just different colored uh, masters. So one day when he was arrested, he went on this Black Maria and they were all arrested under the emergency act, under really the worst kind of act, that, the kind of act that, the kind of law that uh, people like Michelle would, you know, fight in court for uh, against. But when he went up the Black Maria, he saw six beautiful young women and he was surprised. And he wrote in his memoir, he said, he was surprised, he was very curious, I mean, we are all like, you know, seditious, we are all Isham Raiz, Adam Akli, Stephen Sim, no, not really. <laughs> we are Michelle Yasudas. But what are these six beautiful, quiet women doing here? Right? Um, so he was curious, he asked them, you know, I know small creatures, but what do you do before you were arrested? And the answer came, we were prostitutes. He was shocked. And why were, why were you arrested under emergency law? He said, then the woman said, uh, we, was, we were actually working, we were actually members of PKMM. You know, even though we were prostitutes, we were members of PKMM. We were, kita orang Ibrahim Yaakob. We were Ibrahim Yaakob's follower, chairman of PKMM. And uh, when the British soldiers came to us for sex, we actually did you know, information about their, you know, about them about them, about their, their political information, military information, and that is why, that was why we were arrested. Nameless six young women who has become part of our independent history. The fight that went on, despite being very quiet, despite being very quiet. I think um, the problem about, the problem that we are facing today is really we are and especially I mean including sorry not especially including in the fight for gender equality gender mainstreaming we just Bukit Matajam just organized our first um, how should I put it gender responsive and participatory budgeting program where we we pick up a state constituency about thirty thousand people Matajam Bubo and we allow them to vote for how they want to use our allocation. So about 2,000 people came up, came, came, came to vote. It was really like an election in Kimmetaja. And we decided to say, hey, it's not just going to be only men's voice. We, we, we were trying to weigh in how women can actually contribute from the beginning. So for example, the, the, there were three projects that they were allowed to, to vote for. And all these three projects came from uh, focus group discussion. Not only with politicians, but really with uh, regular residents of this constituency. And not only among the men, but we have focus group discussion dedicated just for women, for children under the age of 12, asking them, what do you want to see in your area? And thereafter, we got three uh, projects, which we then allow the constituency to vote for. And uh, one of the projects won. What I'm trying to say here is that in our quest for solving the problem of our society, then that, that includes uh, gender, gender equality issue. I think a very sad situation that we are facing today is that we have substituted uh, the political problem. This is what I, what, I, what I wrote in my recent article about calling each other stupid you know, after the Sarawak election. Uh, I said, we have substituted the political problem of injustice with the cultural problem of intolerance. This is what I mean. You know, it's very easy for us today to say, hey, let us respect them. You know, women want a different sort of thing. They really don't want to be uh, Michelle Yasudas. They want to be at home. They want to take care of the kids. They are different, you know. Or maybe the Malays, they are not like, you know, what you did, we are thinking about. They really want to be ruled by this very feudalistic, very chauvinistic, pro-Malay party. So if your opposition wants to win over the Malay vote, you should actually tweak yourself to be a bit more like, oh no, you know? You know, if you women wants to win, wants to win this game, you should actually wear a pants and, you know, be like a man. It's just a matter of 
differences between us. It's not a matter of injustice. And if it's just a matter of differences, cultural differences, uh, mindset differences, or even gender differences, then the problem is easily solved by asking us to be tolerant of one another. And therefore, you have slogans like Satu Malaysia. Everybody, you know, just try to live together, tolerate each other. But really, it is really a problem, a political problem of injustice. It's really a problem of systemic injustice. Uh, a woman and a man goes to work. You know, whatever differences you have between uh, Shalina and myself, we go to work today. I don't think Shalina expects to be paid lower than I, right? It, is, it has nothing to do with that sort of differences. But the fact is, and this is, uh, this is, this is from, uh, this, this is well researched in our country, yeah? the fact is, the system is such that women are consistently uh, given lesser, whether in terms of pay, in terms of uh, exposure, in terms of respect, in terms of whatever. So I think uh, it's very important uh, not to use so much of this, this really bloody word, tolerance. I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. has never used the word tolerance in his, in his speeches. You know, it's always about, I think we have lost the the, the concept of good politics, emancipatory politics. Ahmad Bostaman has never said, let's tolerate one another, you know, we, we Melayu, China, India, in this great land of Malakana, Melayu, we can actually group together and fight the bridge. No! He said, Merdeka dengan Dharma. It's really political, it's a political problem. It's not just a problem of culture, it's not a problem of interest, it's not a problem of, a hey, Muslim women really wants this very weird thing about being ruled by their husband and being spanky and that. Now I left. No. No, it's not. I don't think so. I don't think. At least I don't think so. I don't, I don't think you can tell me. I don't think so. It is really a systemic problem of our society. And I think uh, politics is, remains a good uh, platform to resolve this issue. Thank you. Stephen and Nina and of course Michelle at the beginning. Uh, we'll talk afterwards, maybe over a drink, about your admiration for uh, putative international war criminal Tony Blair. <laughs> uh, we'll have a private discussion about that. Okay, very, very wide range of perspectives and, and views, some historical depth, some very much to do with. Uh, uh, the here and now, in particular cases um, that were um, highlighted. Uh, let me just talk a bit about noise, uh, noisiness. Noisiness is very important sometimes, although you put the case also for a certain amount of quietude. I just kind of <coughs> think of three very successful movements from three very different parts of the world in which women collectively, and I think this is an issue, uh, collective rather than the individualization or the ability of singular women to emerge through the interstices or the cracks within the system. Let me just give you three examples, three different parts of the world. 30 years, 30 years, the leading voices against the politics of impunity in uh, Argentina have been the mothers of the place of May who have marched for 30 years making a lot of noise, literally, because they go there banging their pots and pans. Partly that's representative of the very fact of the domestication of women in that particular society. But the noise that takes place every single week reminds everybody that there can be no cultural impunity for the most heinous uh, of, of crimes. And that's entirely been led for 30 years. Uh, truth has to be there, but so does justice, because without justice there can be no reconciliation. And that's the kind of discourse I think that collectively, and these are ordinary, sorry, I don't use that, word, use that phrase, ordinary women, but actually they're not very extraordinary women. Secondly, closer to my experience uh, in Northern Ireland, I would say that the most important social movement that finally drove the peace process, it's still a very fragile peace process in Northern Ireland after 
four decades of war was actually the women's movement that actually bridged the communal divide uh, and that actually created the basis for the possibility of uh, uh, peace. One of the bitter ironies of all that is that women in Northern Ireland politics are almost invisible, but the social movement, the collective social movement, that created those possibilities certainly uh, should be acknowledged. An example close to home, maybe it will be on your own remit in your new job. In the Philippines, a uh, 20 year struggle led by women that successfully uh, managed to pass the Reproductive Health Bill in the Philippines. Extremely important piece of legislation that for the first time ever in a Southeast Asian country actually gives women uh, say, voice over something as crucial as reproductive rights. And reproductive rights ref reflect and rebound on many aspects of society. And that's even in a very conservative Catholic society like uh, the Philippines. So just three examples. And I guess the point I'm making is that none of you particularly stress the sort of collective dimension of women's movements. So I wondered if you might want to say something to that. Uh, a second uh, comment from me, uh, Stephen, I, when I was teaching at Manchester, uh, I, I had the great privilege of working with something called Diane Elson, who eventually went on to uh, head up UNIFAM, United Nations Women's Programme, and they did, they pioneered in the late 1990s, it's hardly been taken up, ways of doing national accounting that precisely factor in the invisible, unpaid, domestic labour of, of, of what you call house, homemakers or, or housewives. And how important that is when talking about uh, redistributive politics uh, as, as you were. Um, and a lot of work has been done about this. Uh, Pauline and Lillian Fan's mother, Noeline Hazer, was also another pioneer, uh, again through Unifan. And I think Maybe some of those things have cascaded into your gender participatory budget here in Penang. Perhaps more can be done. The third point I want to make is one that was touched upon. Some of you were here for Karim Dinal Junior's very, very interesting talk on his book Radicals, where he chose to actually focus in particular on ours, which was in the late 1940s, early 1950s, precisely the contribution of women politically. And he did it through the biographies of three women, one of whom joined the uh, Kaugi the Amno movement, one of whom joined PAS, and one of whom joined uh, MCP, the Labour Communist Party. So three trajectories. But the point of the analysis was that women were very present in that particular time. And in some ways, uh, uh, possibilities for women's political participation actually narrowed before, I think, perhaps it's the Reformasi generation that uh, has come about. Maybe one last little point, a little reflection. When I used to teach Third World Politics 101 to British students who didn't know where anywhere was, <laughs> but um, th th there's an interesting thought. Elite women versus the great mass of women. Uh, I had a colleague uh, in my Manchester department who wrote a fa fabulous book on, on, on apartheid and class in South Africa called Maids and Madams. And that strikes me as being kind of interesting because a lot of middle and upper class women can precisely have these careers because in fact they also work upon or benefit from the labour of other women, which is an interesting phenomenon. But I, I did say to my students, if you take a line, let's, let's look at our geography, from, let's say, Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto, Indra Gandhi, this is Banbara Naika, Sheikh Mujiba, uh, what's her name? Sheikh Mujiba, Aksan Suchi, Sukhara's daughter, Asia has had more women leaders, actually, than Western European, at the very highest level. We're talking about prime ministers and presidents. 
But who are they? They're dynastic daughters and wives and so on. And we're also replete in our own politics with those kinds of uh, dynamics as well. So these are some of the sort of issues maybe I want to just throw on the table, uh, taking my privilege as MC. But let's uh, open up the floor. If somebody can help me with the mic uh, to throw it around, then we'll go back. My little help. The Santa's help. Get your hat on. Okay. Let's open some questions up from the floor to all or any of our three panelists. Don't run away, just because you like to throw me the I'm really impressed by what you said. I mean, uh, I'm at a loss as to see how how uh, much we can occur. We can overcome, especially in a country like this. I think the problem that women will face in this country comes with two points. One is the psychological feminism that exists in the Malay culture, which definitely would like to put women at the periphery and uphold the male dominant society. But even more dangerous than that, I think, is the rise of uh, Islamism. With the kind of Islam that we see in this country now being promoted by the powers and be, it's the kind of Islam that wants women to be subservient. A woman that is uh, available, a woman that is manipulated, uh, that can be manipulated, and a woman that is silent and obedient. Now, how do you all see the struggle of women in the light of such overwhelming odds? Thanks, Arifin. Let's take uh, let's take a couple more, Mr. Russell. Obviously, you've you've uh, you've encouraged very quiet people to come to that. So <laughs> I'm not having any of it. I'll get my schoolmasterly hat on and start comparing me to ask questions. Any more? We want to take uh, Arifin. <laughs> question. So um, I'll just touch a little bit about, you know, obviously there's the, the rise of Islamization. And um, I do agree that right now, you know, I have, I'm sorry, do you want me to stand up? Okay. So I, I do have been very vocal about speaking about this. I mean, being a Muslim woman, obviously I feel that, you know, we need to stand up and, you know, speak up. I mean, right now we do have groups, uh, movements, like um, organizations rather, like uh, Sisters in Islam and IRF. They're very vocal, and we know that, you know, with with being vocal and being, you know, very opinionated, of course you're gonna somehow get into trouble. But that's okay because we have people like Michelle to you know, help us out. <laughs> so um, it's pretty obvious that what we need to do is obviously number one, raise awareness. Number two. Obviously, don't shut up. And number three is to, you know, educate people. The fact is, yes, in, in Islam, you know, the, the, the way it's being interpreted right now, it's very ultra right wing, very dangerous. It is pretty much, you know, what I would say Wahhabism. You know, it's, it hates women. And I feel that this is not right. This goes against, you know, what Islam is about. You know, there are many, many people out there who also understand that, you know, Islam, it's, it's a very beautiful religion. You know, it teaches, you know, equality, and you know for a fact that, you know, the Prophet Muhammad was, you know, he was a very strong figure that championed women's rights. But somehow, rather, this is not being, you know, it's not being broadcast. People conveniently forget this because as what Prof said, they want women to be silent. They want women to, you know, come across as being very passive, very docile and just, you know, just be there for, you know, men. And this is not right and this is not what, you know, again, progress and what religion is about. And um, did I answer your question? Uh, yes, you did. But I said we 
I mean, you look at the way they start to be the prophet is seen to be anti feminist the way he is portrayed. This will not be the case in this case. I mean, we are told, and he married Aisha when she was age of nine years old. I had my doubts a little bit that Aisha was nine at that point in time. You go back to the historical records, she's probably around 15 or so. But this is the kind of uh, use of the prophet in terms of putting women where they are. And most of the, the, the time that they talk about the prophet, they never talk of the influence of his wives on him in some conditions that he made. But the prophet is seen as a person who commands his wife to do everything and they do so without the I'm not I'm not sure whether the kind of Islamic teaching that we have helps in the way in the British or put them down. I, I, I agree with you as well. I mean, I also have my doubts that, you know, Aisha was nine. I mean, there, there are also different interpretations that she was actually 19 or 21. And I feel that this is a topic where, you know, it would be nice to have someone like Mr. Wanji to, you know, to, to, to discuss. I mean, yeah, this is, this is where the, the problem is with religion right now. I mean, be it, you know, Islam or any other organized religion, it's, it's all based on interpretation or misinterpretation. And this is, you know, where it becomes a dangerous game because in this country, you're taught to not question religion. You know, if you do that, then obviously, you know, you get into trouble. And again, you know, we have people like Michelle to, you know, help us out. But, and again, you know, this kind of comes back to my point earlier. You cannot be afraid. I mean, yeah, I mean, what's the worst that can happen to me? Yeah. There could be tons of really bad things, but my point is that know that there are a lot of other people who share the same views, so you have really you have nothing nothing to lose. You know, if you really care much about this country, then by all means, you know, let's do this together. So okay, I'm gonna let these two guys uh, speak. Uh, that's a very good question, and from Shalina's point of view, I cannot give a very religiously technical thing because I'm a Muslim. But as a non-Muslim and as I observe what has been happening, because um, this is something that has been happening progressively ever since 2000. We crossed in over 2000 during the progress of Islamicization because I remember when I was a child, things are different now. The way my own relatives were Muslim, the way they were behaving in the 1990s, and now it's very different. And the second thing is because I look Malay, so every time Ramadan I can actually tell when things are intensified. Last time I could eat and behave, you know, misbehave, and you know, I used to smoke in public, look to my parents uh, during Ramadan. Ah, I'm scared. I'm scared. <laughs> Especially, you know, I, you know and, and so there is that temperature barrier for me at one aspect. And the second aspect is that the way everybody has been shut out on having a discourse on Islam. Faith, and it's because of political Islam. It is just the deepening and the rise of political Islam being more. I think the political being bigger than Islam itself in this country. And the second thing, the sixth thing I see as the cloak of sanctity. And that is something I think Muslims ought to start fighting with and somehow enlarge the space for non-Muslims to join you. Because in, in Malaysia now, you have this thing called cloak of, I call it the cloak of the ones that we used to be called my theory, which is where it makes it famous by Hitler. Where when you cloak something, this is sanctity, this is sacred, this is sanctity. Islam, privilege, ketuanam layu, all these things, you know. You mention it, it's someone mentioned in our constitution. We talk about it, you know, it's you, they're coming for you. Sedition, you know, like Eric Paulson, he talked about Jakim, he said Jakim is promoting extremism. On Twitter, they came for him, they made an office, they tried to take out Nutella. They, they thought there was something in our teller and tried to open our, our fridge. Okay, that's, that's another story. Anyway, I'm so very upset. But so the point is that anybody that talks about Islam, you're not Muslim, you're not allowed to talk about it, we're taking you away. You're Muslim, you talk about it, Wanji, Khalid Tamad, you are a heretic, take you away. So that's the process of delegitimization, making somebody a heretic. And this is the practice which has been done like in medieval times. But the point is that now, a lot of us who used to be more vocal, I remember in 2011, when we were fighting against the law that prosecuted transgender women for dressing as men, we were more vocal back then about the practices go back to now. Now we just fight the lawyers who will talk about the law. We're not going to talk about how they are using the text against trans women because they, they were raping them. You know, 
they were using that law, yes, your men, this is a woman, were going to put you in the van, take you to the long cup, and then we're going to rape you because you deserve it, you're not human. This is clear perversion of Islam. I'm not a Muslim, but I have no religion that you rape somebody. But the thing is that not everybody is scared to talk about it because when the Muslims talk about it, they make it like Islam. If I talk about it, I'm a heretic. And the point is that, and when we talk about the non Muslim, Muslims that, you know, the, the more maybe pro government, the people that see it okay to quite to be Islamist as a political tool, they will tell us to shut up, stay in your space. And if you're a Muslim and you're talking, they'll tell you to shut up and you're not a Muslim. So this tuck and pull on both aspects, because as much as sisters in Islam, IRF is doing a good job. Also, do not forget that every time a Muslim speaks out, they get branded as a liberal, and all the people on the ground that say that they are conservative Muslim back the past. Very good example. A lot of very good people have been in the past, but once you're branded as a liberal, no matter what good work you do, you'll be de delegitimized and you will lose traction. And so these are the tough and poor things which I think we need to start paying attention to. And how our friends that are Muslim have to deal with the tech liberal. Because a lot of Muslims, they resist the liberal label and why when liberalism is not about having free sex parties you know? I don't know why people immediately assume when you are liberal you want free sex you want all the gay people so you will be, be junket by gay people you know they'll touch you you okay and um, you know unicorn rainbow parties everywhere you know that's the point maybe reclamation you know if you look at reclaiming liberalism what is it exactly this is just about personal freedoms and having the state stay away from your business yeah, I'm just thinking, this, you know, maybe a way to retain our space collectively. Uh, that's it. Yeah. But there is a point that I want to mention. Which is, it came to me when I was uh, debating with some of these uh, Muslims on uh, women's uh, liberation. How do you position it? Because here in this country, when I talk to some of them, I say, a classic example of a woman who should only be put under lock and key is the Prime Minister's wife. <laughs> See that? Kind of that is total liberation. Is that the kind of woman that you want? So when you say, sorry, but I think this is important. But when you talk in terms of giving women our gay women role, where at what point do you reach it? To the point that we won't find it jarring and use it as a means to attack you and pay you to do a corner. Because they look at those parts and say, look. That is the case of a woman who is totally she buys the sort of working bag, she spends without any consumption, she goes anywhere, you know, and does everything, and you say stupid things. Where do you find? I never thought our forum would have somebody saying, most of us is our role model, but then we go to the dan sebagainya. Okey, kita tahu dalam uh, Malaysia ni kita ada satu institusi di mana mahkamah syariah. Dan hari ini kita lihat bahawa uh, banyak kes di mana uh, pasangan bercerai kerana tidak mampu membayar uh, nafkah pendapatan nafkah zahir. Dan jika uh, ini berlaku, uh, pengimbangan ini berlaku di mana lelaki terpaksa bersaing dengan perempuan untuk mendapatkan pekerjaan. Dan kita lihat sektor pekerjaan semakin terhadap kerana lelaki terpaksa bersaing dengan perempuan Dan akhirnya menyebabkan uh, Ok kita tahu dalam Islam lelaki, walaupun perempuan bekerja, lelaki tetap kena bayar nafkah Jadinya bila lelaki gagal untuk mendapatkan pekerjaan terpaksa bersaing dengan orang perempuan Jadinya dalam daripada sini akan menimbulkan kemasalahan untuk membayar nafkah tadi jadi dia akan kembali kepada mahkamah syariah dan uh, akan berlaku beberapa masalah di sini. Jadi adakah sesuai dalam konteks itu kita nak melaksanakan kesaksamaan dalam organisasi atau pun tidak? Terima
the student uh, is real kind of act. So, and they posted uh, children just carrying very glittery yeah, clothes and uh, ending the scene with the first thing, killing all the Israel legs. Yeah. So, so she was very vocal about uh, that. This kind of thing shouldn't happen if there shouldn't uh, uh, plants things that that the ideology of past that is it's, uh, they're, they're still very valuable age. So uh, women who knows that that this is not right, why is not? But she has um, she has some. Experience it in the UK and things like that. But what, what I noticed recently is uh, government, as in the federal, uh, they're stopping or reducing a lot of uh, students from going out from the country, their yeah, exposures, and in terms of applications, uh, systematically they are changing uh, and just. Uh, Teaching students in the universities, local universities, I think, they have a lot of this film. So, uh, just in the gun forming stage, a lot of things have been put to their mind, and then uh, teachings that would be taught to the men for ladies. For example, Kelantanese women are known to be quite uh, proactive. Uh, Aceh had four successive queens in the 17th century. You know, so Minangkabau women are also known to be quite uh, proactive. Yeah, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial, <laughs> entrepreneurial, in fact. Uh, so uh, I think it deserves a study if somebody can ex can can answer how this did. Uh, situation turn around for the worst, and it will be a really interesting and uh, fulfilling uh, study. The second thing is uh, uh, Pankers, Emily Pankers. So I think one, uh, she's, she's a role model, we all admire. Um, so let me let me try to kind of recap the the question that 
dan saudara Nasir tadi menyoal ya. Uh, kami kat sini tak minta maaf tak sebab tak tak berapa faham tadi. Tapi adakah tadi soalan tu mengenai uh, mahkamah syariah dan bagaimana komuniti dan apa ataupun suami dan isteri dapat mencari nafkah yang Tapi kita tahu dalam Malaysia ni ada satu institusi nama Mahkamah Syariah Ada institusi nama Mahkamah Syariah Di mana hari ini uh, Saya tak boleh bagi nombor tapi uh, memang banyaklah Banyak kes di mana uh, kes penceraian berlaku kerana Gagal memberi nafkah pendapatan kepada isteri Untuk dalam Islam, lelaki, lelaki uh, walaupun perempuan itu bekerja Lelaki tetap kena bayar nafkah kepada perempuan kan, Nafkah kepada isteri jadi dia hari ini banyak kes yang penceraian uh, suami gagal membayar nafkah kepada isteri. Jadi dia bila dalam banyak uh, lelaki terpaksa bersaing dan uh, mungkin makin makin banyaklah kes-kes pengangguran, kes-kes lelaki terpaksa uh, ni. Jadi adakah sesuai uh, lakukan kesesamaan ini dalam kemaslahatan uh, dalam negara kita? Okey, terima kasih. Okey, terima kasih. Oh, faham sikit. Jadi saya akan beri peluang kepada kaum lelaki untuk menjawab. Uh, okay. First of all, I think uh, just okay. Nasir's question first. Um, I think the problem of men not being able to afford alimony because they do not have a job. It's not because women are competing for jobs. That what, whatever. Okay, okay. No, 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 but but you get what I mean. I think our friend is trying to express a concern if the job market is saturated because certain culture demands certain action from husband and wives, women and men. Uh, and uh, because women are now in the job market as well, there's an intense competition. Until men has no work, unemployed, therefore, if there is a, in the case of a divorce, in a Muslim case, he, can, he is not able to pay enough car. But my point is this, that I, I don't want to comment on the Islamic point because I have no idea whatsoever. But my point is, men today are not unemployed because of intense competition with women in the job market. As it is, the situation of employment is not very good in our country. I know because uh, this is one of the issues that I constantly raise. Of course, the minister said we are now in a situation of full employment below 4%. But there are so many issues underneath this 4%. Yeah? Uh, but the fact is that the current situation is not because women are competing. Yeah, and I don't believe, uh, and I don't, I, and I, I don't believe that even if we have, we, we are able to increase women's uh, participation in the uh, uh, workforce in the job market, uh, the problem would be men having to compete with women. I think uh, everyone deserves to find jobs. Everyone deserves to find a decent job, whether you are a man or a woman. Uh, I, I don't know whether I answer this question, but this this is a matter of principle rather than. Uh, matter of uh, religion. Uh, I like it that you raised about this international practice on uh, gender accounting. This is nothing. I mean, I, I don't think there's many things new under the sun. This is nothing new. But the problem is our country. And as long as we do not tabulate women's cons contribution in that manner, the government can say, why should we distribute resources there? Because we do not see any contribution from that perspective. So I think it is very important, very important. And how do we do it? How do we do it? Um, let me acknowledge here that some of the best NGOs, civil society in Malaysia are women's group. For example, WCC, you know, groups like our SIS. Uh, brilliant research, data driven, uh, a lot of political advocacy. And I think, maybe I'm biased, I'm a politician. I think at the end of the day, political action is a very important component in our struggle, uh, Prof. Arifin. 
Nobody's going to hand us the power on the silver plate. Nobody's going to say, hey, we met today, let's you know, go do this. You, you, you know, I, I give you the quality. No, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen that way. Uh, hey, you poor, poor, poor man or poor woman, I'm going to give you this. Well, I'm going to dispute. No, uh, the suffragettes showed, showed it to us that it is true, intense political struggle. Uh, terrorism or not, maybe another session. Um, elite women versus grassroots women. I, you know, I was running through a lot of names in my head and that, there's not many that I know of. Uh, and suddenly this name came out because May 13 just passed, right? Quietly in our country. It wasn't very quiet at my house because that's my birthday. <laughs> but I was surprised to find out that the Episcopal Church actually has feast days for saints. Yeah? I was surprised, yeah? I thought only the Catholic Church do. And I'm surprised, more surprised, delightfully surprised to know that May 13th is the feast day of this person called Fanny Perkins. Anyone know who is Fanny Perkins? Or Francis Perkins? No, that's the problem. She was the first cabinet minister of the USA. First ever woman to help the post of Secretary of Labor during FDR's time, which basically means she was the person behind the idea and implementation of the New Deal. But none of us know who is Fanny Perkins. I didn't know because I was searching May 13, any good dates, any good, really good stuff to talk about on May 13 other than my birthday. And I found Fanny Perkins. She was, uh, but you know, she's not uh, some orang miskin, setingkat something, you know, she's not. She's an elite woman. They were, they were, they were campaigning together with the, the elites in Greenwich. New York, uh, and they were like you know when they were when, when they were campaigning against uh, against uh, forced labor, women's labor, uh, child labor. They had this very interesting logo, Women's Consumer League or something like that. And they had this interesting logo for those companies that comply to the uh, forty-hour work week. You get this logo from 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 this organization, and they actually campaigned all the socialites at that time to boycott buying clothes, buying uh, items from companies that do not comply with, uh, with, 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 this, uh, with, with these principles. Uh, elite women, can, I mean elite men or women, can be the uh, catalyst for change, can be catalyst for change. And I, I, on the other hand, I want to quote, you know, I'm sure you agree with me on this one. Arun Dati Roy, come on, yeah? Uh, this is something I read some time ago, I hope I can find it here. Um, yeah. You know, she said this. She said, uh, yeah, all of us are sinners. Uh, in fact, she even said this. You know, she leaves off royalties from corporate publishing houses. Just like you. <laughs> I have to empty my pocket every, every month for your bookstore. But this is what she said. If the sledgehammer of moral purity is to be the criteria for stone throwing, for advocacy, for political action, then the only people who qualify are those who have been silenced already. Those who live outside the system, the outlaws in the forest, or those who pro whose protests are never covered by the press, or the well-behaved dispossessed. And not the well-behaved elites or the rich, but the well-behaved dispossessed who go from tribunal to tribunal bearing witnesses and testimony and getting nothing in return. So, you know, there's always this dilemma whether the elites can... Uh, and I think this is a dilemma that is facing our country today with the current uh, the regrouping, the realignment of different political elites who were formerly enemies coming together, you know. So the question of whether elites can be or drive or can be a catalyst to certain political changes, I think they can. But I want to challenge all of us. I mean, I believe most of us here are in the middle class. I want to challenge us to really look beyond some of this nonsense in the middle class, including what I call the tolerance nonsense. Really look beyond this and think about, uh, look beyond our, our comfort zone. I guess that's what, 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 the, 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 the point I want to make. Look beyond our comfort zone. Look beyond our own uh, neighborhood. We, we want. Uh, look beyond our, our the island, in fact. Look at mainland. When we think about the transport master plan, for example. I heard recognition just now, and 
I said, go to the shop, please don't mention this word here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a look beyond our comfort zone. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks, I didn't realise it's, uh, it's so late, it's quite late. Uh, 10 past 10, so it's past now. Uh, <laughs> um, but I have to give the, the last word to uh, guest of honor, Michelle. And, uh, Michelle, you, you just started a new job, you're, you're with Amnesty. It definitely has a regional focus. Uh, something very close to my own <coughs> long term campaigning has been around, through something, I'm a chair of working group in something called Asia Europe Eagles Forum which has been in existence since 1996. And I guess in my activist life, the thing I'm most proud of is that we have got legislation in place in, in European countries about the extradition of people charged with trafficking. Most of the trafficking is taking place in Southeast Asia. Uh, from a personal point of view, and maybe over a drink we can talk about it more, what's Amnesty doing by what I see it very, very important question in relationship to human rights and gender rights in particular. Trafficking, particularly as Malaysia, is uh, one of the global hubs of uh, trafficking. And Penang is one of the hubs within the hub. And where, where do you see your work with Amnesty going, particularly with regard to issues of gender and feminism? Uh, thanks, guys. That's a, I was going to ask you about trafficking. And the thing is that if my work prior to this advice for liberty is actually virtually nothing to do with trafficking. However, since I started with Amnesty, strangely enough, the most recently, if you recall, in May, I'll keep you short, last year, another thing when the boat people from the Rohingya standard. And so, Amnesty, strangely enough, you ask is looking to launch a one-year anniversary probably at the end of the month. I was actually part of a mission in, uh, that came to Penang and also we went to Belante because it, a lot of people actually don't know what happened to the Rohingya people that came on the boat. I think we saw videos of Al Jazeera of you know, men and women coming on the boat, you know, crying and then you don't know why it was where they went. So part of the mission was actually to find out what has happened and so the horrors we discovered on that journey, a lot of it, there were people that were on the boat for three months, or six months, and then lost the track of time, a lot of people watched people die. And a lot of the people that were on the boats were actually young women. Rohingya young women that either A, had nothing left for them in their own country, or B, because they have people here and they want to go and fight their husband, their brothers and the uncle were here. And some of them were actually trafficked. And the issue here, which we have met with a lot of people when they said, look, a lot of the women, I personally have met some women who, because their life wasn't very good, they had family that's already here, paid money for them to come in to get married off to some other guy that they never met before. And these are 19 year old, 18 year olds, and they're married to 30 year old men, 20 year old men. And this is essentially trafficking. But when you speak to the authorities, the authorities think of it as what, but they willingly came here to get a better life. So are they complicit? So this is for smuggling and things like that. And then there's one aspect, and there's also a lot of gender relations within the Rohingya community, which a lot of people refuse to LA, they do not acknowledge. It is complex, it is different, and there are a lot of things that people say because there are aspects of the Rohingya communities where they are sometimes patriarchal. Women, from what I understand, are not allowed to work if they were to speak with an interpreter, they have a barrier, so they can't speak with men. And these are just different practices. In Malaysia, there are also certain practices. But because of these things, a lot of people think, I don't have to bother with the Rohingya community because we're the very patriarchal in the present situation. When, and people fail to realise, a lot of what is happening is because of government. The government delegitimised the existence. The ambassador of Myanmar has gone to see them in Belante and said, these are not my people. So this is the recognition of the state where they do these things. So coming back to it, after these experiences, there are Rohingya, there is a mass grave site in Pokot Sena where there is 200 graves of people that when they were found at Wang Kaliya, they didn't know what to do with them. So the Islamic, I think police, the Islamic Council or State Department together in Kedah, buried them in Kedah. And no one knows who they are and you know, 
because people just didn't pay ransom for them. So there's this entire huge situation happening in Malaysia. We, you know, we all don't know, you know, until we found the death camps, remember? And then we have authorities. And why nobody has been pointing fingers who is complicit in that? There is a death camp. People have been dying, and why have they died? Apparently, because after they've been trafficked there, you can't, family can't pay the ransom, family can't pay the money that they were paid, they were supposed to be trafficked, so they left them to die. They're found in cages, and then at least 200 people and more are coming. And, but why do you know, you know nothing has happened? Only recently, four people were charged, and they were all ranging people. And one of them was like a teenager, I think, so like a young boy. He's like 15, 16. So they said that this has been going on for five years, so this boy, the trafficking person, he was 10 years old. Does it make sense? I mean, so there are just raised more questions, you know, for me. It's like, is anybody complicit in this? There's another question, because this trafficking has been going on for years. How come we don't know? We police don't know. Who is, you know, so the question is, who is really part of this thing? Because it's been allowed to go on for very long. And everybody that seems to be arrested and caught are the religion themselves. Do you really think the religion can carry out such a complex trade? of thousands of people coming in and people dying of everything. <coughs> so there is this question of well, what can we do about it? So Amnesty is looking at it has gone on a mission. We'll be releasing a report on these situations and after that our team is carrying on the refugee migrant project because the thing about refugee migrant here, civil society struggle is not as well articulated as things again. The National Security Bill <coughs> I was a part of that and the we, the uh, advocacy in refugee migrants, it, it is, we have dropped the ball ever since Irene Fernandez passed away. You know, I mean, that's just my perspective, you know. And a lot of us have left it. There are, of course, the people working on it, especially in Penang. There is a lot more work, I feel, after it has been done in long. But I think it's really time for civil society to start removing because there's, there's a lot of things that were not holding people in impunity. It doesn't just extend to people in Malaysia, but people who are living here as well. And I think we have all dropped the ball on that because when we go for per se, when we go for all these things, oh, right, yeah, Malaysia, 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 you know, we are very xenophobic. We are xenophobic to our friends from other countries who come here to live and to contribute to the economy. You know, and so these are things which we all need to just start looking into. And yes, Amnesty is like making a comeback on these things. Yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Good. Uh, it's really past that bedtime. The thing I'm sad about this evening is we all know Michelle, or those of you who don't know Michelle, is this uh, activist, lawyer, troublemaker, loud mouth, noisy girl, and all that. But she's also world champion hula hooper. And she bought her hula hoops. Oh. And she left them in the body hotel. What good is that? <laughs> whether she could block to task and talk at 100 miles an hour, which she can, <laughs> and hula hoop at the same time. But we'll have to wait for another time before that's possible. Friends, let's give a warm hand to the man on the cell phone. <laughs>